Pledging. Is, is you want these lights out too? Oh, I'm fine with those lights. It's it's not working again. Are there overheads on a dimmer? Come down a little bit. Well, let's first get the slide show. I know it's showing. Need to do batteries. Hey, okay, so I'll move, since we have movement. This is R.R. Anderson, and he's a micro-political cartoonist. If you don't know what that means, it means he only does political cartoons in Tacoma. And he was sitting in a city council and got really upset because this is back in the summer of 2008, and the city council was thinking about throwing up a chain-link fence around Frost Park because undesirables were camping out there overnight. <laughs> and so he put together a competition for the master of the universe, and everybody who wanted to participate would have to go down to Frost Park and draw on the sidewalks with chalk and... Oh, Oh, I'll, I'll just keep going forward. So <laughs> it was a lot of fun. And the second slide you saw up there was a guy named Kevin Freitas put together a website called Feed Tacoma. And we were posting our photographs of the chalk and people could see them there and vote to see who there was their favorites. And all that summer long, we were doing chalk and just having a blast. But you know what? Come September, it rains. And it's really a pain in the butt to chalk in the rain that we tried. So we got together. A guy named Elliot Trotter got me, James Stowe, and R.R. Anderson together. We went to the two coin. We sat down for lunch, and we brainstormed on what we wanted to do that winter to keep the art going. And we said, well... We want anyone who comes and be part of this group to do their own projects. No one funded mandates. If you suggest it, you do it. And the rest of us will, if we want to, be part of it. And sometimes as a group, we would look for other organizations and be part of that. And if someone would reach out, we'd be part of that. We just wanted to be out there. And our mandate was to be silly. And so... Stowe pounded his fist on the table and says, by God, I want to wear fez. So, <laughs> and this is us at the, our first meeting. And the first thing we did was Iron Artist, where a bunch of artists got together and we all competed and we didn't know what we were going to be doing. This, we were given a model and said, you got to dress her up. So that was the first thing we did. Then we moved on and... Uh, 24-hour comic, this is an international event, happens on the first October of every, uh, first Saturday of every October, and you have to do, pick, find a venue that's open for 24 hours, come up with a story, do the sketches, do the inking, and basically do a comic, a 24-page comic in 24 hours. And that's quite the challenge. And we started doing this every year, and that would draw people in and go through this unique torture. We also came up with another, we did little easings and started distributing them around businesses, and they would have different themes, and we would vote on which themes we'd do the next month and which businesses would get them, and that was a lot of fun. You can get these as PDFs at the CLAWS website. We also got involved with uh, First Night, any one in our group who's capable of doing caricatures. We just went down as a group and volunteered our services at uh, Brooks Dental, and we drew caricatures of people all night long. We heard about ways, because, oh, God, get on some of that action. <laughs> and so we then uh, started doing ways goose posters, and there we go. Decided to turn the print into a T-shirt, which was later sold at King's Book. You can probably still get these at King's Book. I even think they might glow in the dark. <laughs> well, we had a sense of altruism because we were artists and were very unrealistic. And so we decided to... <laughs> 
Any type of funds we got together from selling t-shirts, whatever we put into a student scholarship fund, you can still apply for the fund. It's only up to 300 this year because we've been a little inactive. But hey, if you know of the artists, have them apply. One of the things that each one of us had a fair amount of experience with marketing, advertising, and working PR stunts. And so whenever we got an opening to any type of media outlet, we jumped on it. So it was really great to be on the cup of, our, of uh, Tacoma Art. It got us a lot of publicity. This is the old um, Ammo Cat Cafe. And we were drawing huge crowds to our weekly drawing sessions. Learned about the hundred monkeys. So we, we put together a uh, hundred different drawings of monkeys and other drawings and put them in brown paper bags because we had people in our group, some who were professional illustrators like myself and some who were rank amateurs. And so we didn't want to know, let anyone know who was getting who, so you had to buy, buy them blind. That was a lot of fun. Hundred monkeys. Every okay. Uh, this is a toy drive at um, Geeky Stuff. We would get if we heard about a friend who ran a comic book store or a geek store, and they were doing something. They reached out to us. We would always find some way to participate with that. Again, take advantage of PR. And there's a couple of rules with PR. Make it fun for everybody. There's so many sad sack stories in the news and doom and gloom and death. Do something that's full of fun and joy and people will eat it up. I had everyone in my neighborhood was handing me a newspaper saying, I found you in the newspaper, I bought six. <laughs> <laughs> and you find other groups. Like, did you know that there are groups of cosplayers out there that cosplay for charity? So we reached out to this one group and we arranged to them to do drawing sessions both at our group and also at the uh, Tacoma Art Museum. And when we couldn't get a hold of the people at the Tacoma Art of them at the Tacoma Art Museum, we got a hold of the Dockyard Derby names and used them as live models. And we had so much fun using them. And I loved going in and posing them around. Everyone said it was really good at that. I just liked to have a little hands on. <laughs> And it never helps, hurts to have a little bit of political endorsement. Again, this goes back to the chalkies. <laughs> Doing seasonal stuff is always fun. And this was a really fun event. Um, I think this was either a creative colloquy event or before that, it was a, a poetry reading. And so me and Elliot Trotter, Trotter did a, poet, a poem gave me the script and then I did a bunch of uh, drawings on acetate film and manually moved them around to create sort of like a rough animation. So if you, you can still see this on YouTube if you look for up, up and away. Oh, missed the silly. Again, our mandate was being silly. You only saw the green roads for a little bit, but they were really fun. Um, the green robes, that was at the Night of Pythias. The Night of Pythias opened their doors to us, and they loved watching us have our stupid ceremonies in the Grand Hall. <laughs> so just, and this is, we would invite people who have supported us to become a friend of Claw, and they would get a leopard skin fez. <laughs> moving, moving forward. Uh, this is Warren Cave, one of the first recipients of the Friend of Claw. He, um, this is our very first art show that we did at the now defunct uh, Tacoma Art Supply. And we learned a lot about this. And one was that all the art that we were doing, a lot of it was digital. So what little framed materials we had were poorly mounted and were difficult to organize. And we thought, you know, what we really need to do is get frames or just canvas work. Let's just go down to the thrift store. So we started going down to the thrift store to buy stuff and then we realized, you know what, we got these wonderful paintings. Let's not waste those paintings. Let's just add monsters into the background. <laughs> so here's a nice before and after. And so we showed the, our first show of this was at uh, Art of Tacoma Month at the uh, downtown um, 
post office, and it was a real big success. We sold, we started selling paintings right away, and then we started moving these around at they rotated from coffee house to coffee house for years, and we kept selling paintings for lots of money. We, I mean, we would buy these things for less. Our mandate was get a painting for less than 20 bucks and then mark it up 400. And we would sell them between about 150. I think the most expensive one was 500, but that was seaside property, which had this giant Godzilla coming out of the ocean. It was about four feet tall. It was really, you can see these on our blog. Just type in at the bottom of the search, you know, thrift shop paintings. And we also did hobo dollars where we would draw on Monday. We would come up with these ideas during our meeting. What should we do next month for our drawing session? Now, we also mounted this along with another art show, put the art in Brooks Dental because she wanted to have some rotating art. A guy who collected hobo dollars saw this and bought our whole stock. He just, well, <laughs> so that went into the student scholarship fund. Though so that, uh, um, that screaming cowboy one on the $20 bill is still available. Did, did I go too far? Was that the last one? Okay. So we, this was another pop-up art project that one of our members came up with was John luc Picard Day. And this was really successful, so much so that she did another pop-up show, which was the Women of Star Wars. So we were, again, the whole thing, I won't go into something right here. We've got a philosophy. I saw this video on YouTube a few years back, and it really captured what we were doing. It's sort of like, in this video, there's a hillside, and this guy's at a concert, and this guy's just dancing like a nut. He's just having so much fun. And then something wonderful happens. Somebody else goes up, joins him, starts dancing, dancing with him. He gets a big hug, and the two of them start dancing, and that broke it. That made other people come forward and join them. And within two minutes, the whole hillside is full of people having fun and joy and dancing. And you know you have to get in on it because sooner or later the song ends. And that's a lot of what's happening in this art community. If you see some wonderful guy dancing on a hillside, be that second person that causes the momentum. So next up. Um, here we are, we're doing another drawing session, but this time we're riding the wave of the uh, Tacoma Rocks, which was happening just before the pandemic. So that was a, a wonderful draw. There's a group up north called the Cartoonist Northwest, and every year they have an open art award ceremony, and they ask for people to s submit any artist underneath various categories. And we decided, you know what, we've got a lot of artists, why don't we some, get a bunch of talons of the cloth in every category? And we pretty much swept the awards that year, so that was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> this is Anthony Duzak, and he's one of the guys on the hill dancing. He decided it would just be fun to have one night a month where you could watch an old horror movie from the 70s and the 80s, and then... But he did something really clever. He started inviting artists to do movie posters for, for him. And so I was fortunate enough to do a bunch. Here's a couple of samples of mine. But the problem was he only was doing it once a month. And I had this whole group of artists wanting to do more, not just members of the club, but all over the sound, saying, hey, can I do a print? And I said, yes, you can. We'll do, start doing them at the Grand. So that's what we started doing next. And then those are some more samples. We did a show at the, at the public library. We start, um, this is Freelance Fandango. They meet on Friday, um, um, meet on Mondays. And when the, the pandemic hit, we just took that online, had great fun with that. During the pandemic, still kept active, did stuff with the city. And 
This is one of my current projects. This is uh, my Tacoma Artist Initiative project. And what I have, this is Tolson Plaza. And I tried to remember as many pop-up arch things as I could. And in front, you can see Lynn there in her sweater. And it's got <laughs> hidden objects. And I think there must be five different hidden objects just in her sweater alone. <laughs> And this is my current project that I just finished. It's a Kickstarter for the I Got Shot vaccination pins. Shameless plug here. I got a bag full of them over here. They're $14. See me after the show if you would like to pick up one of those or one of my deck of playing cards. 15 bucks. <laughs> and and that's, that's my presentation on how to be a, a media influencer. Sorry. Yes. It, I noticed on your first uh, postcard where it said Tacoma that you made that there was a cow in there as well. Why, was, why did you choose to have a cow in there? Well, the, the art in the lettering was of a futuristic Tacoma and it had UFOs in the background, so I thought it would be a good way to tie the future with the past. Yeah. You know, cows. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, any other questions? Yes, I am. Uh, this is COVID related <laughs> in so much as um, I started, uh, had some minerals leaking out of it. And then, uh, so they said, well, you got to have it pulled out before it crumbles. I said, oh, okay. So had the tooth pulled, they put in an, an implant at the same process. And then I went to the dentist to get a cap. But so it looked like it was all done in one shot. But then when I went back to get the final cap, they tapped on it and went, oh, it's infected. We got to take it out. I went, oh, man. And I just had a mouthful of stitches taken out because when they went in to take it out, they also decided to shave my jaw. And so I went off. I just came off a liquid food diet only to go back on a liquid diet. But yeah, it, it'll get replaced eventually. But yeah, there's something missing right there. Thank you so much for pointing that out, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> Any other dental hygiene questions? Okay, here we go. <laughs> Not a dental hygiene question, but how are the Knights of Pythian doing post-COVID? Uh, the Knights of Pythian are this close to reopening up the hall. They were extremely active during uh, the pandemic. They're, I think they had more attendance on their Monday get-togethers via Zoom playing everything from, uh, oh, a, a card game called, what, Something Against Humanity? Oh. Cards Against Humanity. And when the online version of that uh, got yanked off the internet, we switched over to Draw Source, which is pretty much like win, lose, or draw, but on the online. So we were, and we were also having a lot of fun uh, just reading up on, uh, on the old lore and reading through some of the ceremonies and talking about it. it was, it's, the Pythians have been going strong. I think they're planning on opening it up uh, next month. There was talk about opening it up this month. Any other questions? Thank you guys so much. So, Eric, at age 63, has been homeless, uh, is part Native American, is a self-taught computer programmer, electronics designer, a photographer inspired by Norman Rockwell, and he once took a photography class with Art Wolf. He's an aspiring artist, college dropout, loves to swim, and is learning to scuba dive. Is that right, Eric? That's about right. <laughs> he loves to read books, and at one time he owned 10,000 books weighing tons, and now 
His books are on his tablet. Eric has written programs in about nine different computer languages. He became so fluent with computers that he is able to think directly in the programming language the same way that people are able to, to think in English or French. He was an undiagnosed, undiagnosed high-functioning autistic with a very high IQ and substantial physical coordination issues. As a child in New Jersey, he spent most of his time alone in the woods and playing with frogs in the creek. Eventually, he became aware that the trees had a consciousness and that they were part of a collective mind. Their roots were like neurons in a giant brain. At some point, he had a direct experience of that consciousness. He never used to talk about this, maybe only telling half a dozen people. And now, everyone knows scientists have come to the same conclusion, and several documentaries have been made about this. Today, he works as an audio, engineering, audio recording engineer and also a video streaming producer. Eric? Gosh, I didn't realize she was going to read all that stuff. <laughs> I've been very um, low-key about being on the autism spectrum, but uh, whatever. I'm on the high end. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but it's not really like that. It's, it's not, a, not a linear bar graph. It's more like a jaggedy thing. Some things are, I can do well, other things not so much. But... Anyway, so now I guess everybody knows I'm autistic, but I generally just try to hide that. But, uh, oh well. Anyway, uh, <laughs> she asked me to tell her about my life so she could figure out what to say. So I just dumped everything on there. But anyway, I fell in love with photography when I was three years old. And um, we had hiked the Misty Trail, or I guess there's no why on that, but anyway, the, in Yosemite. And um, we went to the uh, Nevada Falls Overlook, which is really steep and really difficult hike. And here I am three years old and doing this hike, so. <laughs> but anyway, it went well. Um, uh, but while we were up on the Overlook, um, my dad, handed me his camera. And he said, look through this viewfinder and uh, pick something nice and push this button. And I was just absolutely enthralled that a little box could capture an image um, that you could later look at. And so that was just this magical moment. Um, and I've been fascinated by photography ever since. And I suppose I ought to show some of these photos. Oh, no. Ah! Darn. <laughs> we, it has been such an incredible battle getting everything. As, as Lynn was saying, we haven't done this in over a year. And so getting everything redone and such with the added complication that we're also videoing. Last words, but uh, should work. Ah, no. Ah, there we go. Okay. All right. So anyway, um, except it's going the wrong direction. Come on. Trying to get it back. Dim the lights, please. Ah, yes. Um, well, I can do it. Oh. 
Yeah. All right. So um, if I can get this thing to go back to the beginning so we can do this properly. Um, it's not. Um, Ron, yeah. the slideshow needs to have the focus. If you clicked on anything, then the focus would change. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So Ron is helping me so that I could be up front here. Usually I'm the guy behind the curtain pulling all the levers and pushing the buttons and like the Wizard of Oz. But, um, but uh, Ron's been just a huge help. Um, he's uh, started helping me with the Sunday services because it's, it's a very complicated process making everything function. And, and it's... that we're right on the ragged edge of uh, the reception so that uh, so it's only just barely working. Okay, the reason that I took this picture is because of the contrast between this big fancy Hyatt Hotel and the reality of people sleeping on the streets and this huge schism that we have in our society. Um, And that, I just like the way it looked. You know, it's, it's just nice composition. Um, I like to take my camera and go for walks. And, uh, um, and a typical walk is five to 10 miles. So you have to be in pretty good shape to do that. But I just wander around anything that looks interesting. I spend a lot of time thinking about the background, actually. That, that car wasn't just by happenstance. Um, I, I look at every element of a picture and uh, think very carefully about what's happening in the background. Um, I tend to take a lot of pictures of birds and buildings, and sometimes I can get the birds and the buildings in the same shot. Now, the reason I put this sequence here is Look at what happens with that flag and how does this picture change the way that it feels depending upon the position of that flag. I stood there a long time just getting different poses of the flag. And um, come on. Ah. There was supposed to be, there it is. So that's, that's a very different feeling to it. Than that one, and we're gone. Okay, well, I think I got the point over. And then birds, and more birds. Now, there's a helicopter that flies, and I didn't know where it flies from until I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. 
there's a lot of serendipity involved in photography. Um, you just have to be there. And I had seen this helicopter flying around Seattle, but I didn't know where it was landing until I happened to be behind Harbor View. Um, there's a park there and there's a really uh, nice lookout of the city. And there I was, I'd, I found the helicopter uh, pad, landing pad, but these are very random. They only run rescue flights. And so the chance of me actually uh, having the ch uh, a photograph of the helicopter itself um, was amazing serendipity. But there I was out there just taking pictures of the city and lo and behold, here's this helicopter. I've been wanting to photograph it for quite a while and just all of a sudden I was there and it was too. So, <laughs> so I, um, so I just took a few photos. Um, I wanted to also respect patient privacy in that too. You, you see his arm, but nothing else. Um, so, the, and then I was down, um, I had to run up a flight of stairs in order to get this. I didn't know when it was going to take off or how long it was going to be there. So I went down a flight of stairs and was taking more photos. And then all of a sudden I heard the engine kick in and so I've got a backpack and a camera, and I'm running up this uh, fairly lengthy flight of stairs, and I managed to get it taking off. And um, that bird I managed to get into this picture, and I waited quite a while for the bird to get in the right position. <laughs> so it may look like a casual photo, but these are well planned. So I was intrigued by this paint job on this building. Where is it? Um, that is on Lower Capitol Hill somewhere. I don't recall exactly where. Um, dogs are highly prevalent around Seattle. Um, well, everywhere, I guess. But people really have this love affair with their dogs. And so um, this seemed particularly photogenic. And when I was out on this particular walk, I, I had been to Freeway Park. I'd read about Freeway Park and people made kind of a big deal out of it. And I'd gone to look at Freeway Park and it didn't seem like anything really. And then I discovered that I'd only ever seen about a quarter of the Freeway Park. I never saw this passageway to this whole other expanse of it. It's really huge and uh, has a real, lot of nice things there. And we're back to more of this. There's, there's a lot of that. And this one in particular, now I, I like to, one thing I do is, is I try to not manipulate an image. Um, I like to make the best image that I can with what's actually there without moving things around. So um, this Bartell drugs and so much of homelessness being to do with drugs. Um, and then this casually tossed aside. So we have throwaway people, we have throwaway scooters. Um, and then I was on my way to the bus stop. I was walking from Harbor View over to um, uh, Stewart, uh, which is a bit of a walk. And, uh, and I just happened to see this off in the distance. And I thought, well, that's all those pretty lights, you know, but uh, wonder what's going on. And so I just started photographing this. They had, ultimately, more cops kept arriving. They had nine cops there, ultimately, um, in order to have a conversation with this one gentleman who's obviously having a really bad day. Um, but. And I never did figure out what was going on, but one thing that was peculiar was that they actually seemed kind of lighthearted. There was some smiling and laughing. I don't know how you smile and laugh when you're being arrested, but, um, but the, the police were very professional. I, I know we always see in the newspaper about how horrible the police are, but that's because the newspaper never talks about the 98% of the time that the police are doing it right. And, um, um, and these guys, I watched them. They were totally professional, totally polite. Um, ultimately, they did decide to arrest him. 
I noticed um, they laid out a bunch of stuff on the car, so I suspect that, yeah, you can just see it there. I suspect that he got busted dealing drugs or something, but as I said, I never, never did figure out what was going on. And then um, lots of people just like to have their photographs taken. We, we've become a very photogenic society um, where people really enjoy uh, interacting with cameras and such. And <laughs> I was just sitting there actually reviewing some photos I'd taken. They walked up to me and said, hey, take our photo, please. So I did. Um, and then um, another serendipity, and I've got about two minutes left here. <laughs> um, after church, my mom and I went to uh, Pickwick's which is this really nice little funky hamburger stand that we like to go to. And it was closed. And uh, it was 4th of July, and we were thinking, well, where, what, what can we do? Where can we go? And, and then I thought about um, this really nice park, Ruston Park. Um, and, um, and they were having an air show. And we had no idea they were having an air show. But, um, but anyway, we went there, and I got to take all these wonderful pictures. And one of the things about this, though, one of the arguments you see a lot on the internet is people saying that the camera doesn't matter. It's all about the photographer. Well, that's not really true. You could never take this picture with a cardboard camera. The hardware really does matter. And, um, and I'm happy to say that uh, thanks to COVID, I was actually able to go get a really nice camera uh, that enabled me to take pictures like this. And I think that's telling me I'm done, but that's okay because uh, this is the end of it anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Gosh. Okay, thank you. I have a Fuji X-T4 and um, with two different lenses um, so I can go from uh, 24 millimeter up to 350 between the two lenses. Um, this is, I believe that second and Pike, somewhere around there. Um, there used to be a clock tower there. It was really famous, and now they're doing all this construction, so um, it was a historical artifact, this clock. And um, so, but with the construction, they've removed the clock and um, put up this really nice painting. So, okay. More questions? That's, um, that just uh, is vinyl. I think it's like a vinyl wrap over some sort of frame. And the person, it looks like a cloud on his head. The person? That's an umbrella. Oh. Yep. Oh. Yeah. Um, I'm still trying to figure out how to get my work out in front of people. So, um, I've, uh, uh, many years ago, I rented some space in a gallery downtown and almost sold a picture. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, that's one thing I haven't really figured out yet how to do is, is the marketing side of things. So, um, but, uh. Um, but I'm, I'm happy for some advice. <laughs> so, yeah. I, I, I noticed on your um, helicopter photo that you managed to get the blades pretty much stopped like that. Do you know the shutter speed you were using for a photo like that? Um, I think it was about three hundredths. Okay. So, yeah, you can adjust your speed depending on how much blur you want, but that gets tricky because you can spend so much time fiddling with the camera's speed that, that you miss the shot. So, uh, so I 
just a lot of times I just leave the um, the camera in automatic and then I use exposure compensation to to get what I want. There, there's a few times, mostly when I'm photographing flowers or something, I want to get a little bit of a blur. Then I'll deliberately adjust the uh, shutter speed. But most of the time, I just let it be in automatic. Um, yes? Um, I do some. None of those were edited. I prefer to. Um, uh, I prefer to try to. Uh, it's a challenge, um, but I like like to make as as pure of a photo as I can with with as little manipulation. Although sometimes I just I want to be creative and I manipulate something specifically. But most of the time, I'm just doing straight up photography. So um, including. With found items, I didn't include any of them here, but I'll uh, I'll walk around looking at the ground and I'll see interesting patterns of leaves and plants and such. And I just like to make the best photo that I can with things the way that I found them. Um, I mostly don't rearrange stuff. So. Great, Gary. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Mario, um, so the way you do your slides is, I didn't get a chance to talk to you beforehand, sorry. It's just been a real man, okay. frantic day. Okay. Okay, so you use this to go forward and backward. I'll okay. put your slides up in a second. And then um, uh, the other thing is, we seem to be right at the border edge of the reception, so holding it up helps. Um, with making the connection. So also, there's a laser oh, pointer here. I can here. use that? How, did, yep. how so do you do it? You just push that button there. Oh, OK. I'll see if I can find a time for that. OK. All right. And then uh, that's it. Great. Thank you. So was anybody here last time Mario did a presentation at Tripod? Three people. Three people. Well, it was awfully entertaining, and that's why we invited him back tonight. Uh, so Mario uh, Lorenz is a performing artist, event producer, and business district manager for the South Tacoma Business District Association is almost complete with his latest venture, a book called 101 Mario-isms. He will present some of the humorous content of this book at the show tonight. His last presentation for Tripod was titled A Day in the Life of Mario. He is very excited about the opening up of everything after the long experience of the pandemic, where playing cards became his newest form of artistic expression. Uh, before he comes up, I just want to tell you about two of the images he had in that show that he did last year. Um, first of all, when I invited him to do it, he said, God, what would I do a show on? And I said, well, you're so active in the community. You're on boards. You're on committees. You uh, invent uh, uh, events. And just do a life, a day in the life of Mario. So... <laughs> One of the pictures he took was the inside of Lily's restaurant. <laughs> and he was looking at a table that had obviously had people eating at it, but they weren't in the picture. And so he showed us a slide of a, an empty table in Lily's. And he said, Mark Lindquist was just sitting at this table. <laughs> <laughs> it's very funny. And the. <laughs> The other thing he did was uh, his very last slide showed him playing a bugle. And he does play musical instruments. So he said, I'm showing you this picture of me playing a bugle because the slideshow is over. <laughs> Mario? No.
Uh, is, uh, oh, yeah, there, there. I don't have to talk so loud. Oh, oh, wait, I can't start yet because I'm not. When does my time start? Yesterday? Okay. Uh, okay. I got to figure this. Is there, I have a, oh, yeah, no. Okay, so if I just uh, go like, that's, that's very, it's working really good, Eric. Okay, maybe I'm hitting. Okay. So, oh, there, there. Okay, oh, shoot, I wanted, to, I wanted to bring this out anyway, because, uh, 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 yeah, everyone needs a new toy from time to time, and mine is the clarinet. So I'd like to share that with you right now. I got this about uh, two or three months ago, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to play it for you right, right now. You have to plug your ears. We haven't even played it yet, lady. <laughs> Don't worry, it won't take very long. story when I, I I got the clarinet for the first time in college and uh, and uh, we had a class where we learned all kinds of musical instruments and the, the clarinet was uh, one I chose and uh, I took it home and I practiced it for 10 years or so <laughs> I never gave it back <laughs> anyway I, but I felt I know it was funny to me then but you know apparently not to you folks but it's, so I, I got guilty. I felt guilty about not giving it back. So I took it down to Rochester. I was living in Minneapolis at the time. I took it down to Rochester, Minnesota <clears throat> to give it back to the instructor. I walked into the door of the college. I walked up to his name was Gordon Denuser. I walked up to him and said, Gordy, I, you know, I, I, didn't really, I didn't want to say I stole the damn thing. You know what I'm saying? But I said I, I didn't return the, the clarinet. And I just wanted to return it. And he took it and walked away and didn't say a word. And he looked back at me. <laughs> he looked back at me and he says, "Did you learn how to play it?" And I says, "Well, a little bit." And <laughs> and he never said anything and just continued walking. <laughs> I, so anyway, I, I got this one about uh, two or three months ago. And uh, uh, gosh, it's a long story, but I don't think I'll have time. Come to the next show and I'll tell you the rest of the story. Okay? <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna move on right here and into the next thing. A vision. This is something I wrote when I was doing comedy in in uh, in. Uh, uh, it was in, in uh, what's the state down below us? Uh, yeah, that's it, Portland. That's it, yeah. And this was written about a guy that, was, uh, that took the, the green room away from the comedians and, uh, and, and just made them sit in the bar and in the restaurant. We didn't have a place to wait for the show anymore. And so I wrote it about him. A man without vision dances in the flowers but has no idea where the pollen comes from. And I'm, and I'm thinking the pollen in this case was the entertainers, you know, and they were just putting them out. Anyway, that club died. But that's another story. <laughs> okay, the next one is, uh, yeah, life is an incom incomplete act that happens to you sometime between you are born and when you die. And I, I drew that, you know. Maybe. Give a big hand to Mark. Wasn't his show terrific? I, Mark, Mon did I get that right, Monlocks? My God, the guy's got talent, doesn't he? I, maybe I can get in if, in a couple of years or so. You will see. Anyway, that's that one. Then I wrote, these are Marioisms, okay? Some of them started in 1995, and I, I've just now got them together to try to put a, a book together, and I've got 101 of them. I'm not going to do all of them tonight, but, but this was something I wrote about, I don't know. You guys aren't laughing, so maybe you can't read. I don't know. I'll just... <laughs> You want me to read it? Americans are great. They are willing to put religious differences aside. On one hand, they have no spiritual or moral values of any significance. Yet, on the other hand, they are very moral and totally convicted. In either case, they are most willing to share those values of spiritual and moral conviction or non-conviction with the entire world. Anyway. Yeah, well, that one I might drop out of the book. I don't know. Life and art. Once your life is lived, it's like an art object. It's not yours to decide what to do with. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I like that one, too. And this is me doing the mummy last uh, Halloween. 
Oh, good. There we go. You're never off the track. And that was to be the only part of it. I thought, that's life. That's what we're about. You're not off the track. You're just, you, you missed a turn, maybe. Or you never, <laughs> or, or, or you can make a new track if you miss the turn. Or you're never off the track if, if, with spirit as your traveling companion. You're never off track if you still have your eyes on the prize. You're never off track if you're wearing your galoshes. You're never off track if you're wearing your mask during COVID. Oh, by the way, I, I got one that matches my pants. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Okay, and so you're never, well, anyway, you're never off track if you follow your heart. And that's really what it's about. Okay, look. Oh, good heaven, this one I love. Look, keep your eyes on where you're going and not at what has fallen around you. <laughs> that's very important for me. Oh, oh, it went too far. Oh, it does go backwards. No, it goes too far. Oh, wow, I'm this is working just fine, Eric. I don't know why you had all the trouble. <laughs> okay, the acid. Oh, this one. <laughs> well, God bless Rush Limbaugh. He's moved on. But this one, this one is about him. I have discovered that most people, in hindsight, that is, that most people criticize. Who, well, I can't read it. I've discovered that most people who criticize Rush Limbaugh have never listened to his show. Even he admits that those who don't listen to him are the first to criticize. They used to say the same thing about drug taking in the 60s. Don't knock them if you haven't tried them. I find listening to Rush and taking drugs has a similar effect. <laughs> to alter the perception, perceptions of the users. Actually, I like to take drugs while listening to Rush. One cancels the other out and makes me feel balanced. <laughs> I want to sell this book. I think some of it's worthwhile. <laughs> Okay, part two. I, I actually I had things listed in the part in the breakdown, but I did. I, they're just parts right now. I got part one up to five. Okay, so fire. While watching the holiday fire, I wonder in awe how the sun keeps on burning. Has any of you ever had that? Uh, anyway, I, I still have asked my wife several times about that. Seeing in the dark to expand my vision, I must learn to see in the dark. Yeah, that's a good one. Okay, appreciation. While interpreting the contents of a fortune cookie one day, my wife, Caroline, inquired, what does it mean? My reply was simply, some things are better appreciated than understood. <laughs> yeah, okay, I will unlock my spirit, unlock my spirit and let, I'll un unlock my heart and let spirit fly, let it fly, fly, fly. The only real foundation in life is spirit. I don't know if you guys believe that or not, but... Uh, you, you can believe it if you want, okay? <laughs> okay. Oh, this is good. I love this one. Strength and weakness. My wife and I have a wonderful relationship. She is strong where I am weak, and I am weak where she is strong. The balance is perfect. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'll drop that one then. Okay. <laughs> Justification or appreciation. One day when I was discussing the acceptability of the arts in schools with my wife, she said, well, they've not been shown enough justification. I said, that's the problem. We must forever be justifying when appreciation is the true measure of a truly work of, truly, truly work of a worthy work of art. Go ahead, justify the Grand Canyon. <laughs> and these are actually pictures of a friend of mine that took the, she does balloons down in New Mexico and she flies over, that's Dottie on the right there. And uh, these are pictures of the Grand Canyon and she also has horses in Montana. I just thought that looked good and should put, go in there. Anyway. Next, hit the right, hit the right thing. In response to the school child's question, how do you balance a peacock feather? I replied, if you keep the top up, the bottom will not fall down. <laughs> it's a lot like government. You know, that was that one. Getting my goat, this was a cousin that I just, was just, I, he was bothersome, okay? In response to a bothersome cousin who gets my goat, well, that's it. I'm not telling you where I tied my goat. That way you'll never get mine. <laughs> and this actual, I don't know why I put this with George Carlin. I probably will remove it at some point. But this was a picture that a friend of mine took of the fire last year in uh, Oregon, on the Oregon coast. And it was off of her balcony. It was... I hope it was a night shot, but I'm not sure. Well, George Carlin, wondering whether I should be envious of George Carlin is difficult to be remarkable in every way like George. He has been remarkable in many ways in order to achieve his success, I thought. Well, I thought, how many ways are there to be remarkable? And at the pace I'm going, do I have the time? 
Anyway, <laughs> part three. Move. Okay. Oh, good. That's a nice one. I like. I like that one. Oh, uh, that, that one. Circle. This is just philosophical here. I think you must touch the circle in order to know what's at the center. Once you know the center, you know the circle. That is deep, I think, yeah. It's, it's, I'm, I'm kind of swimming underneath it right now, trying to. But that was an at a labyrinth. We used to go to the labyrinth. It was out in Gig Harbor. Uh, uh, the, the member of our church had that labyrinth, and, uh, and, it, and she doesn't have it anymore. Oh, this one's so cute. Size matters. But this one was a movie, and it didn't turn out that way. This, that, actually, this, the balloon is blowing up during the course of it. Anyway, I'll. Get that one out of there. This was when I was on the road doing comedy in South Dakota or someplace. Uh, oh, this is clever. We were, but the article is about Jesse Jackson Jr. in 1996 when he said, in order to get nudie, we must, and he spoke of the ideas that might expose his lack of vision. We were at, at the time at Reverend Barbara King's Hillside Church in Atlanta. She had a huge, huge church. And uh, she was an Amazon woman. She was huge. She was tall, about six foot six or seven foot tall. And anyway, I did not speak up at the time, but my thought was the real goal is to build the vision, not destroy the blind man. Anyway, yeah, well, that one might go too. I don't know. That one's <laughs> race. When asked why people are different colors, my response was we all live in a melanin patch. Anyway, <laughs> move on faster. Life is an incomplete act that happens between. Didn't I have this one already? Yeah. OK, let's move on. Part four. Oh, here's, this one's good, because this is a friend of mine. Uh, her name is Heidi. And she's the one driving that canoe, and it's coming into the Grand Canyon. Uh, Life is life and death. Life is not worth dying for. Death is not worth living for. But life and death are worth it, whether we live or die. <laughs> Some of these, I really take a long time to think about them, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but what she's doing right there is she, she was a guide in the Grand Canyon, took people down into the center of the, of the Grand Canyon. And this is them hauling the garbage from the people that camped down there for a week out of, the, out of there. And that was just a photograph that she had taken, and she sent it to me. She's also the woman that did some painting on this church several years ago, and she had a bicycle three-wheeled bicycle that she rode from South Carolina, North Carolina? Yeah, North Carolina, all the way across the country, up to Alaska and back. She did it in about nine months. It was, it was an amazing trek. If you ever want to check out her pod, what is it when they do it online? She, her blog, you can go to Heidi, crazyguyonabike.com, something like that. And she's got a whole story of her whole thing. It's just I said, you've got to publish. OK, life is a relationship with ourselves and others in which we can linger in it a long time without really knowing whether or not we want to be in this relationship or not. <laughs> and this is, this is, where's that pointer? This is me. How do you turn this on? Ooh, works great, Eric. Oh, there we go. That's me. This is my, that's the guy next to me is my best friend, Barry, and, and uh, you know, my girlfriend, uh, uh, Charlotte right there and uh, you know my teacher Vera who just passed away about last year not long ago at 107 years old anyway she looks she's a little younger than she looks now uh, in this picture anyway but she was something else uh, anyway this really didn't have anything to do with anything but I just kind of liked the photograph and put it in so yeah, it's in, yeah. Well, let's just look at it for a while, shall we? Okay. And and reincarnation. Lives may pass before your eyes, but the center remains constant. In other words, there's only one life after life after life after life, and after that, it's more of the same until it changes. And that change will certainly change the next time around. So please don't die on me just yet. I'm not ready for the change. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I, yeah. And <laughs> these are my grandparents, believe it or not. This is on, my, on one side and on the other side, and then that's, that's Maud over there that who's, anyway, I'll get into genealogy later. Okay, and this is uh, roots. We need to put some roots down so when we die, people will know who we were. <laughs> now that one I thought was better. 
Obscurity. What care I of the obituaries of the rich and the famous? It is, my it is the obscure ones that turn my head, tickle my fancy, and turn me on. I suppose it's because I come from relative obscurity. In fact, there is no one more obscure than my relatives. And, and yet, look, here am I. And this, <laughs> this is a picture of the pigeon. The pigeon guy left these pigeons in my yard, and one of them befriended me. So that was kind of cool. And this is, this is another thing, Roots. We did the same line, but these are, that's a blurry picture. So that's my other side of my family. And uh, one thing for sure is that when your parents pass on, you don't feel guilty about forgetting to call them during the holidays. <laughs> and I think, I think that's, <laughs> these are my mom and dad when I, they were married in 1926, and then their 50th anniversary in 76. So mythology, life is a mythical journey that can swallow you whole and spit you out wherever you choose. I like that one. How are we doing on time? Who cares? OK, good. Oh, God, too fast. Uh, and this, whatever on earth can you be searching for when everything you desire is right here, right now, and always has been, OK? And look at the stuff I have in my hands. Anyway, we are ghosts standing in the wake of our spiritual expression. I know, man. I don't know where they come from. But they're wild. Human. To be human is to stack. Oh, great. My phone's ringing. Hold on. Is somebody calling me in the audience? <laughs> Forget it, O'Hara. I can't talk now. <laughs> to be human is to stack our manifested dreams upon our past in order to become who we are. Boy, I even have to think about these things. I'll tell you. Okay, loss, if you don't want my opinion. If you want my opinion, I think I lost all my opinions. When I, and if I find out where I lost them, I will return to that spot and take off where I left off. <laughs> They're pretty wild. Oh, yeah. I, I, oh, this guy is from, this is one of our chauffeurs when we went to Mexico not too long ago, uh, in early part of 2020. And that's where I learned how to play the card game Homewrecker. I'll tell you about it later. Appreciation. While interpreting the contents of a fortune cookie one day, my wife queried, what does it mean? I think we did this one already. Boy, i got to go back and go through these. Appreciation. Some things are to be appreciated that cannot be seen. Shut your eyes. Go to sleep. Now answer this. Isn't that great? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Bias. She doesn't seem to know anything about anything, so how can she be biased? I like that. I got, I, I got both laughter and booze on that one. I like that one. Dilemma. My greatest dilemma is my inability to be everywhere at once. Yeah. And let's see. There is no urgency in life, only time for choices to be made. In fact, there is plenty of time to make a choice right now if you just hurry up. <laughs> Part five. Oh, man. Oh, there's the cards. Oh, too far. OK. Get that. Well, OK. There are not many people, not many famous people on the earth considering the earth's population, but I believe. But I but, but I believe in the importance. It is important. This one, yeah. This one is one of my favorites. There are not many people. I thought I already did this one. There are not many people in the many famous people in the world considering the earth's population. But I believe it is important to find significance in people who appear insignificant. It is part of my mission in life to uncover meaning where most people do not look. Revealing meaning in life is really quite significant, don't you think? Is this not what life is all about? Should we just stop there? Maybe. We <laughs> I'll go. I'll go really fast. Okay. Well, this is this is the pandemic brought on card games. I think I'm I, I'm gonna buzz because I got the red flag. Okay. Let me just. And this one didn't get a, uh, a thing. OK, my computer is so slow that the stuff I input today shows up on the internet yesterday. <laughs> I didn't say they were all good. This is Mary Bauer, my great, 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 great grandmother. OK, moving on. And this, oh, this is my favorite. This is the end, close to the end. Time seems short. Life is running out. Let's hurry up. This mantra began when I was young, while on the tractor, on the farm cultivating corn. 
I could not wait to get off that tractor, off the farm, and into my life of adventure to seek my life my f and find my destiny. Now that I'm not so young any longer, I would love to have that tractor and the cornfield back beneath me once again. Yeah. Yeah, okay, this is the one that she was talking about. And uh, this actually came from uh, this cornet I got from, from Jim Valley when I was buying the clarinet. When I was buying the clarinet, the person that sold it to me said, oh, I, I need to get 500 for it. And I said, I've never paid any kind, any kind of money like that. So Jim Valley gave me this cornet, and he said, can you get it fixed? So I took it out to, to the, the music shop out there, uh, uh, yeah, Ted Brown. What city am I in? Hal Leonard? No, it's not that. And, and he fixed it. And it cost me 100 bucks. I called up Jim and I said, Jim, I fixed your horn. It only cost you 100 bucks to get it back. And he says, well, I was thinking about selling it, Mario. How do you give me 100 bucks and you can keep the horn? <laughs> so I did. <laughs> and, and isn't it beautiful? Yeah. It's a beautiful. He, played, he used this when he was playing in... Uh, 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 yeah, the Raiders, yeah. This is Harpo. Harpo's horn. <laughs> that's, that's the end of my. Uh, that wasn't funny, was it? No. <laughs> I got a, can you hear me okay? Could you hear me before? Yeah. Okay, so. Who's got a question? Who's somebody in the back? Could you describe Heidi's three wheel bicycle? Not easily, but it was, uh, you know, she, she pretty much had to build it herself uh, because of the journey, because how long the trip was. She started out, she did training ahead of time. She trained for probably, quite a while, two, maybe six months, she went into training and, and just went on short trips around, you know, and, and uh, she found out that when she got out there uh, on the road that nobody knew how to fix her bike. They, they, didn't, they weren't ready for long trips like that. They didn't have bikes that would go that long, and so she had to kind of invent doing everything herself. She camped out the whole way. She uh, packed most of it on her, on her thing. It's just... It's just a, she, she, she's just an amazing human being. But yeah, it's, yeah, she had to, it looked like a trike and she sat back on it and the, the, the you know, you know how they do? Uh, you know, like, I can't even demonstrate it. But yeah, she's sitting back and, and I can't remember, somehow she steered it with those two things, I can't, you remember? She's almost reclining. She's reclining in it. No wonder she could last so long. She was sleeping half the distance. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, it was an amazing bike, yeah. Yeah, yeah, back there. So what's your favorite thing to perform for people? If you could choose one or two things, what would you choose always to perform? <laughs> Next question. <laughs> a favorite thing? To well, I toured the country doing, uh, I had a pantomime show uh, that I was all silent. And... Uh, you know the mime. Uh, the mime brings out a different person in me. It's it's um, magical, but that's an understatement. Um, but yeah, that uh, and I I I worked at a place. Uh, the gentleman here tonight that is from Austin, Texas. That we were talking about Esther's Follies. And I spent about four years there, and a lot of my a lot of my material uh, came out of came out of that time period. Uh, or at least a good deal of it, and then uh, the rest of it came out uh, during, when I was on the road, uh, and and those kind of those kind of shows are hard to find. I would go to elementary schools all over the country, and and work, uh, you know, a school of 500 kids and or a thousand. Sometimes there was 1,200, and sometimes there were high schools mixed with the elementary schools. And of course, in a situation like that, you always had to 
you always had to make sure, because the, the older kids are going to mess with you somehow. And, and the younger kids won't know what's going on when they're doing that. So you have to, you can't ignore anything. It's like everything has to be important. And, and I, when I was, I, I just found out that I, I don't know, Susie, is that who it is? I, I love just being in this situation. I hope this, uh, what I'm doing here will work out. Because <laughs> I, I would like to take a slideshow, because uh, I'm not, I'm having trouble with my knees. And, and it's, it's not so easy to do this anymore, you know? Just to throw these up and catch a ball like that. You know? It's, it's just, I, I haven't forgotten how to do it. And, but the knees, I do cigar boxes in that routine, and, and that recreates, that's probably why I have a bad knee now. I don't know. But, but yeah, so. Um, I, didn't, I didn't do as well in comedy clubs, although I did sometimes. Uh, 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 there was a guy I worked with in Seattle at Giggles. Uh, Oh man, I'll have to think of his name. But he he just you know there's a time when they get when you get to that place where you're just right at home on, on the stage, and that's that's what I look for. It doesn't matter, the audience matters, but it doesn't matter if I'm if I'm comfortable in that place. That's what it is about, and it's always in the moment. And I always figure that it's not me doing this. It's a it's a combination of me and the audience, and then it's the energy, the energy that that we all combine to make that brings it through, and it just Hopefully, I'm just a channel for that, for that energy. Good question. I'll have to think about that some more. Anybody else? Should we go home? <laughs> How about a round of applause for all the people that came up here? Eric and Mark and especially Lynn Danino. So the next tripod is August 20th, and that will feature Sharon Steyer. Many of you know her, and she'll be showing her collages. And then uh, someone will come from the Tacoma Little Theater to talk about uh, this last year and what they expect to be presenting. And the third person is Tom Holt, who is taking pictures of all the murals in Tacoma. August 20th. Thanks for coming.